The whole system is trying to destroy personal freedom. Now, I won't accept the idea that ultimately that personal freedom will be destroyed. We will kick back and it won't happen. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. One ounce silver Kurgerans for only $3.95 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest who is widely popular with our viewers. This is Alistair McLeod. He's the head of research at goldmoney.com. And he joins us this Monday, November 1st, 2021. Alistair, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. That's very much my pleasure, DK. We wanted to circle back with you on several topics of high interest as we head towards the end of the year here. One of those is uh, your viewpoint on what we know now that we didn't know then about Basel III and how it's going to play out or not, uh, and in any making any meaningful impact on the way that metals are traded, among other commodities. We've had people, we got quite excited about it near the end of June, beginning of July, and then it was uh, widely discussed. Well, after all, the rules were modified somewhat to give a little bit of a leeway for the LBMA, and now a lot of these other things are going to come into play at the end of the year and affect more banks. So, what? Why are we not hearing more of a hue and cry and a clamor of scrambling from officialdom about because there's been there's been concern for some time about the potential for re, either rehypothecation of metals on the major exchanges or unallocated uh, accounts that that may be oversubscribed that sort of thing and the the idea that if if major holders of metal claiming it on their books are going to have to come clean by the end of the year that there might be a scramble for the for the physical that is available. What are we seeing now as we head in towards the end of the year about about Basel III and what its likely impacts are in the markets? Well, the lack of any news, I think, reminds me of the old Chinese saying, and that is that um, when visited, the wise man sits on the hole in the carpet. Basically, what he does is he conceals uh, his problem. And uh, this is effectively, I think, what the banks are doing, uh, the system, if you like, the establishment. Uh, they have got to comply with the new net stable funding ratio rules as of the first business day of 2022. And in order to do that, um, they need to adjust their balance sheets. They need to reduce or eliminate uh, uneven positions in the bullion market. We're looking specifically at the bullion market, but it also affects other markets as well. Um, and what we see on COMEX is that we should be seeing uh, a reduction in open interest if they were able to carry that out. Unfortunately, what we've seen recently with the price of gold rallying and getting up to the sort of a bit above 1800 uh, is that the um, managed money category, the hedge funds, in other words, um, have been sort of, you know, a bit more bullish gold and bearish dollar, um, which under the current circumstances, uh, you would think is right. But also, if you look at the technical situation, uh, if uh, the gold price can maintain um, 1810 and above, uh, then everybody from a technical basis will become considerably more excited. So what that means is that you would have buying from hedge funds who have um, less than average exposure to the gold future contract, which would drive up open interest. And that's the reverse of what the um, uh, bullion bank trading desks want. To put that in context, the bullion bank trading desks are contained in the swap category. Now, when I looked at the last bank participation reports, basically uh, the bullion banks represented 73% of the swaps. The swaps in turn represent 80% of the non-speculator side, in other words, the short side of the futures market the other 20% being producers and refiners and et cetera. So it is desperately important um, that that open interest be controlled. And uh, what we saw this week was attempts to do that. 
Now, I think in the background, um, there are various agencies trying to um, sort this one out, uh, one of which um, uh, I, I believe, um, I don't know for certain, but listening to other people who seem to be well informed on the subject, the Bank of International Settlements is in the background, uh, you know, sort of trying to help even things out, um, trying to ensure that the price of gold doesn't run away and so on and so forth. The by far the bigger problem is actually on the LBMA itself, because if you look at uh, the, the most recent statistics that we have in, in terms of outstanding derivatives, and these are produced by the Bank of International Settlements, uh, we see that the LBMA is roughly eight times the size of um, the COMEX market. So that is a far bigger problem. The way the LBMA market is made up is you have obviously bullion banks, you have other people who are involved in there like refiners and um, vaulters and I mean central banks are not members but um, they deal through the LBMA, they deal with the commercial banks and so on and so forth. So. Um, it really represents the whole market. But within that context, by far the largest element of it is um, bullion banks offering, in effect, a fractional reserve banking facility to depositors. So it has uh, liabilities on their balance sheets to um, outside customers. And these liabilities, obviously, um, are either covered uh, by um, positions in the market, or alternatively, are not covered. Now, the market wouldn't exist in the size it is unless it was uncovered, in effect. So you can see that that is the biggest situation. I think the easiest way in which that can be resolved, and therefore it is likely this is the way it will be resolved, is that between now and the 31st of December, I think what these banks will do is they will turn around to their customers and say, we're closing your accounts and this is the ca cash equivalent of the gold that we owe you. Goodbye. So, um, I mean, the alternative which they offer would be custody services, which they do already. And um, I understand that for large customers, custody services um, are as cheap as seven or eight basis points, if you like, which um, is you know, pretty competitive. So that facility is already there. But the problem is that when you release people from unallocated accounts, um, a, a goodly portion of them are likely to try and uh, retain their coverage in the gold or their exposure to gold. Right? These are sort of very often investors or um, uh, institutions, if you like, that can't hold gold directly. But um, you know, uh, under the um, uh, uh, investment rules can hold uh, balances in, 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 in bank accounts. And so that's what this would effectively represent. Now, if they want to get um, exposure to the gold price, then they've got to go into physical. So it, it could be coming at a very difficult time for uh, the banking system. And I think we've got to recognize that. And that's why the situation has to be managed very carefully. I would add a footnote to that, and that is that uh, banks, bullion banks are not forced to close their positions. They can run unbalanced positions. That is not a problem. But there, it gives them another problem, and that is that um, in banking terms, it's not the most efficient use of a balance sheet under the new net stable funding ratio rules to run unbalanced positions. It is also possible to run, say, a short position in London as long as it matches completely and it is identified as such with the futures position on COMEX. Now, um, in order to uh, do that, permission has to be sought and obtained from the Bank of England to do that. And this was probably what you were referring to when you said they've amended the rules slightly. In fact, they haven't amended the rules. This was under 428 subsection F in the original near final rules that were released well, two or three, four months ago, whenever it was. So that was already there. It's just that the uh, LBMA made a big sing song and dance of it, sort of claiming that this was a concession, which it wasn't. Anyway, 
So, so that is the situation so far as I can see. And I think that we'll just have to watch it play out. But um, we're now only eight, nine weeks away from that final deadline. And I think any bank, any bullion bank that wants to get its books square isn't really going to want to last, wait until the last moment. You'll have the, you know, the Treasury Department down in your back. You have the, um, uh, the directors of the bank, the, the executive directors of the back, bank on your back, um, and uh, you will be under great pressure to close down the position. It's doubly difficult for the dealers because um, once you stop running un, you know, sort of uneven positions and uh, make profits by gambling in the market, in effect, running short positions, jobbing against it, which is what they do, then you're out of a job. So they're not very happy about this, I don't think, either. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the Chinese... Um, um, saying that the wise man sits on the hole on the carpet. Basically, you cover up the deficiencies in the system and just pretend that there isn't a problem. And that basically, I think, is where we are with this net stable funding requirement in Basel III. Well, it's going to be very interesting, no matter how it plays out over the next two months, we're going to see something happen, it sounds like. Um, and that's where we're watching that closely. People are trying to anticipate. I mean, you know, the roots of our channel, you've been you could have been speaking with us for many years back when we were reluctant preppers. And the whole thing about preparedness is trying to be aware so that you can be prepared. And they're just trying to get aware of what's likely to play out ahead of that. Um, tough enough when you're in the in the, in the little man's seat, but uh, thank you for giving us your insights from your point of view. There was a, there's a question from a viewer about uh, uh, Tomek who said, does the passive behavior of, gold, of the gold price in recent months tell us that the Basel III assumptions are already included in gold prices? I think it's um, a, a, a reasonable question. I think more than that, what it, what it does tell us is that the thing at the moment is being heavily suppressed. Um, Controlled is probably as good a word as suppressed, but the demands to the same thing. Uh, so that, I think, is the way I would look at it. It's not a question, I think, of something being discounted. I just get the feeling that once uh, the brakes are removed, um, and it could be removed effectively, triggered by external events, uh, such as the realization that um, inflation is not um, transient, <laughs> by any means, um, and uh, it is likely to continue. And as we see the price of oil move towards $100 a barrel, I would have thought that that is something which should concern people who are watching prices as evidence of inflation. Um, I, the, the, the situation is, is, is just simply crazy because um, the real problem that we have with rising prices is really, at the end of the day, got nothing to do with COVID and, um, uh, you know, um, logistical disruption and all the rest of it. You can lay the blame on monetary policy over the last 18 months, which has accelerated the quantity of money in circulation and uh, consequently reduced the purchasing power of that money. And what we're seeing is purely evidence of that. If it was just COVID, you would find that some things would go up, other things would go down. But broadly, the overall general level of prices wouldn't shift that much. But here we see pretty much everything beginning to move up. And that quite simply tells us that, um, as was always the case, uh, that an increase in the quantity of money is behind the price inflation we see today. Yet I don't see anyone in the system uh, admitting to that. I can imagine that um, Fed officials would sit again like the wise Chinaman sit on the hole on the carpet and say nothing. But I mean, for goodness sake, you've got banks with analysts, investment companies with analysts. What are they, you know, what are they saying? I mean, the answer basically is they don't know. They don't understand money for a start. Um, that is clear by their lack of any statement about the current situation. And they're doing their clients and customers, I think, a huge disservice by not understanding money, by not drawing attention to the fact that the quantity of money has expanded very rapidly, and it might have something to do with the intractability of price rises. I seem to be uh, losing my, my campaign to get you to say currency when you're talking about the expansion of the currency supply, but uh, I'll, I'll keep at it. No, you are right. 
You are right. In fact, I'm penning an article on that very subject now, drawing the distinction between money and currencies. But, um, you know, you, you can't necessarily be completely um, black and white on this because you have monetary policy, which has got nothing to do with money, which is gold. They should call it currency policy, I guess. <laughs> In a sense, you can't, you know, it's, 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 it's inelegant to call it a currency policy, as it were. Hmm. Well, perhaps, perhaps that, again, exposes the lie that currency is supposed to be uh, a form of money in most cases. And, and in fact, we've, we're not supposed to be debauched and debased uh, as it has been over and over. But anyway, next topic, if we could move on to is just this last week, a article was broken by Wall Street on Parade. We'll put a link to it in the description of this video. Title is Biden's nominee, Omarova, has a published plan to move all bank deposits to the Fed and let the New York Fed short stocks. And the uh, author of that article points out that, that Biden's appointee nominate uh, for the comptroller of the currency, an extremely high level position in a federal regulator of all the largest banks in the country that operate across state lines, uh, that she has written a proposal, a white paper, saying that we should move all bank deposits from commercial banks to so-called Fed account of the Federal Reserve, and that in, quote, extreme and rare circumstances when the Fed is unable to control inflation by raising interest rates, that it would be able to confiscate deposits from these Fed accounts in order to tighten monetary policy. That means ordinary people's uh, accounts as well. And that if, quote, rises in market value at rates suggestive of a bubble trend, such as with technology stocks or mortgage-backed securities, that the Fed should be able to short these securities, thereby putting downward pressure on their prices and eliminating the FDIC insurance of bank deposits and consolidating all bank regulatory functions at the office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which she has been nominated to head. This sounds like the stuff that conspiracy theories would have been made of and people wearing tinfoil on their heads a few years ago were claiming it was coming our way. Now it's right out there in the news. This is a current nominee for the U.S. Comptroller of the Currency writing these positions. Your view of the real meaning and impact of if this individual, Omarova, gets installed as the Comptroller of the Currency or what this indicates about what's coming for us in our banking lives. I couldn't believe it when you drew my attention to this, um, this lady's white paper. I mean... I, I have got two things to say. It just shows how mad the whole system has become when something like that has credibility. The second thing I would say is that uh, really what she is doing is she seems to be paving the way for the objectives of uh, a new central bank digital currency, because essentially that is what a central bank digital currency is all about. It is about having uh, the Fed having a direct relationship with members of the public, with businesses. Everybody has an account. It means that um, people acting um, for criminal purposes, like, you know, and tax avoidance or evasion and all the rest of it, uh, can be monitored and um, fined or excluded or um, refused to have money or whatever. It means that uh, the Fed can, as part of its monetary policy, stimulate those parts of the economy that it deems worthy of stimulation by issuing digital currencies, which have to be specifically spent in a certain direction, etc. Now, all this is available if you look at the Bank of International Settlements uh, site, where the coordinating committee between all the central banks is based. Um, so in that sense, there's nothing new in what this lady says, but um, it's a bit frightening to have it shoved in your face. And um, you're right. I mean, this was the stuff of conspiracy theorists um, not all that long ago. In fact, I would say no more than a year ago. Um, nobody would have believed it. And I feel sure that if I had tweeted this, I probably would have had my account closed down. I mean, this is just quite bizarre. And um, I just hope that members of the public actually look at this, take on board what actually is involved, and write to your senators, write to your congressmen, in no uncertain and strong terms, drawing their attention to the ridiculousness of this, and how it is such an invasion on people's personal freedom. Sorry, rant over.
<laughs> no, I mean, one of the things you just said, uh, I, I just had to think about it. It's like the difference between getting deplatformed for being uh, fake news versus uh, is, is just waiting about a week before you release your story these days or maybe two weeks because you were right all along and you would have been denied, but then it can't be denied uh, after it happens. But then your, your call, your call blowing the trumpet for people to be up in arms about this, if people understood how... Uh, dramatically this can impact our freedom uh, st stealing our freedom stealing the fruits of our labor um, you, you're absolutely right people need to be taking action now yeah and uh, I mean the, the, one of the things that's interesting I mean we've been talking about the silence of uh, bullion banks in uh, the bullion market uh, given the regulatory changes that are coming on I think equally bizarre is the silence of um, the commercial banking system about um, this new, um, you know, commercial bank digital currency move, because effectively uh, they're going to be cut out of um, having relationships with depositors, if you like. Um, or, you know, will it be a parallel banking universe? I mean, I don't know. Um, but I would say that, I mean, the absence of any debate in the commercial banking sector on this subject, I think, is um, is bizarre. Um, you know, I mean, people like Jamie Dimon ought to be, um, you know, talking about it. But I haven't heard anything. I mean, I don't necessarily follow everything people like Jamie Dimon say, but um, certainly nothing has crossed my desk Um from any of the major bankers in the system, and certainly not in the UK either. Um, it is a bizarre situation. And, um, you know, let's hear from them, for goodness sake, because they've got an awful lot of interest in this, apart from anything else, on behalf of their shareholders. This is a very important issue. And yet we hear nothing. Uh, we have a related question here that leads you into an article, I think, that you've just uh, published your article, Waypoints on the Road to Currency Destruction and How to Avoid It. We have a question from Sudaksek who says, how do you think derivative markets will perform during a crack-up boom? That could produce problems, obviously, because when you get major moves um, in anything, then you know, you get people who are on the wrong side of derivative trades. And this is essentially what happened when we had the Lehman failure in 2008, 2009. Um, so I wouldn't rule that out happening again. But I would say, going back to Basel III, that the objective of Basel III is to reduce the likelihood of this happening by ensuring that derivative positions are properly covered, properly financed, and not mismatched on banks' balance sheets. Um, though, uh, I think as your correspondent rightly points out, if you do get a major move, then that's probably not going to be enough. Um, I would also look at derivatives in the sense that uh, they are a feature of fiat currency. And what I'm looking at now is the process, the waypoints that we will recognize, um, which as we go through one and then the next and then the next and then finally the last one of the four that I, I pointed out, uh, we will see that we are going towards the destruction of fiat currencies. Um, and everything which is denominated in fiat and dependent on fiat uh, will be equally destroyed. I mean, I just can't visualize um, a situation where, uh, say, stock prices uh, are priced in the absence of fiat. I mean, if you look at what happened in Germany in 1923, what happened then was that, yes, stock prices continued to exist, but that was because uh, there were other currencies around, particularly the dollar and to a lesser extent sterling, in which these things could be priced. Uh, value, you know, if you like, there were gold alternatives, but Nowadays, um, with no alternative to the dollar as the reserve currency, if the dollar goes, all the other fiat currencies go. So how are you going to price um, the, you know, stocks? How you, I mean, we know what will happen to bonds. I mean, they will become completely worthless, but we're fixed interest bonds. Uh, I think that inflation-linked bonds might offer some protection, but again, they're going to be priced in a currency which um, will disappear uh, under the worst scenario, 
Um, so what else are they going to be priced in? Um, the, you can price physical assets, I think, but not in terms of fair currencies. You've got to think in terms of what are they worth in the sort of goods that you may otherwise exchange for them. So we're going back to Say's law, if you like. I mean, J.B. Say, back at uh, the time of the, uh, uh, the French Revolution, when you had the collapse of the Assignat and then the Territorio Mandat, saw that um, in the absence of those currencies, uh, basically, um, ordinary people continued to trade. I mean, it was less efficient, obviously, but... You know, the shoe and boot maker would still sell shoes and boots, but he would sell it for loaves of bread. He would sell it for whatever he, you know, felt he needed because he wasn't going to go out and grow the wheat. <laughs> you know, that was not his speciality. So, I, you know, money is, it just makes everything a lot more efficient. In the absence of money, we will still live. But how we value our assets, uh, financial assets, I think they lose all valuation. But when it comes to real assets, then um, I think at that point, uh, gold and silver, and probably even to a minor extent, copper, you know, because that was the other metallic me metal. I mean, we're, we're talking from sort of rich, middle, poor, as it were, in terms of metallic currencies. They're likely to come back. However, I don't believe that um, fiat currencies will disappear entirely. I think what will happen is that at the very last moment, uh, central banks will realize that they have no alternative but to back their currencies with real money. In other words, they will mobilize their gold reserves to stabilize their currencies, but they will need to do it properly for that to work. And um, some countries like Canada um, haven't got any gold at all. Uh, so they will try and piggyback on someone else's, but that's not um, not the best of solutions either. Back to your article on uh, waypoints on the road to currency destruction and how to avoid it. What are the key milestones or waypoints that you call out in that article and that you see playing out in our in our lives? Well, the first waypoint, and I can sort of read slightly above the screen, Monetary policy will be challenged by rising prices and stalling economies, and central banks will almost certainly err towards accelerating inflation in a bid to support economic growth. So this is the first, this is the first um, problem that the central banks are going to face. And we can see this already because um, after the initial COVID bounce, when everybody was sort of came out of lockdown and they had money, unspent money, and they rushed out and they bought this, they bought that. They couldn't go and buy foreign holidays. Um, so their money was sort of channel, channeled into things. Um, we've seen price rises. We have seen an absence of production, a lack of production to satisfy this demand. And now what's happening is that economies are stalling. And that's certainly coming through in terms of the statistics that we're currently seeing. So this does raise the question, what are the central banks going to do? I mean, if they see their economies stalling um, and they see prices continuing to rise, colloquially, this is, this is uh, said to be stagflation. Um, but the reality of the situation is that, you know, how are you going to deal with um, uh, an economy that is uh, declining, um, and, uh, but at the same time, prices are rising? Are you going to say, we have got to stop prices rising? Or are you going to turn around and say, we've got to support the employment objective? We have got to keep the economy going. Well, that's going through at the moment. The second one was what follows on from that. I mean, I, what I would assume will happen is that central banks will place less emphasis on controlling inflation um, and more emphasis on supporting economic growth. That basically is their mandate. So I think we can take it that that's the way that will go. But that leads them into the next question. The instability of rising bond yields and falling equity markets that follows can only be alleviated by increasing QE, not tapering it. Look for official support for financial markets by increased QE. So this is the next big question that is going to face central bankers. Do we continue to support markets? Do we continue to um, support the wealth effect, which uh, we have placed so much emphasis on in the past? And not least, do we um, uh, keep um, 
interest rates suppressed as much as we possibly can uh, in order to allow government finances uh, not to be even more undermined than they are at the moment. So you can see how the second question then begins to follow through. Okay, well, let's assume the central banks do what John Law did. And this is bring us, brings us into the comparison, the historic, the empirical evidence, the, the, the com comparison with history. Basically, what John Law did was he printed money in order to buy shares in his Mississippi venture to support the price. The whole thing failed and it destroyed the currency. So this is where this is going. So you can see that this is the second um, point is very important. The third point, right, central banks will then have to choose between crashing their economies and protecting their currencies or letting their currencies slide. The currency is likely to be deemed less important until it is too late. I'm just, you can see that I'm following the John Law uh, uh, um, you know, example on this one. Um, but clearly, I mean, a central bank is a lot more focused on its domestic economy than on international economies. So it is going to be a lot more concerned about the effect of monetary policy on Main Street, if you like, also on Wall Street, and it'll be less worried about the effect on foreigners. But unfortunately, um, as I've said on your show before, uh, um, foreigners own, um, the most recent figure I have is nearly $33 trillion of financial assets. I'm not counting other assets like property and so on and so forth. $33 trillion of financial assets, including, from memory, I think we're looking at about $14 trillion of portfolio assets. Uh, we're looking at um, about six and a half trillion of um, bank deposits and um, short term bills. And the balance is in um, US treasuries and uh, bonds. So this is a huge number. So if you decide to support markets by effectively sitting on interest rates, the foreigners are certainly going to liquidate their deposits and they will probably liquidate because they'll be losing money hand over fist. They'll be liqu liquidating their bond portfolios. If, on the other hand, the Fed decides, right, we've got to protect the dollar, which I think is the least likely, then basically you've got 14 trillion worth of foreign selling of uh, overhanging um, the equity market. Which way are they going to go? My personal opinion is that they will protect the market first. They will try and keep interest rates suppressed as much as they possibly can in the circumstances. And that basically means that the dollar will weak weaken. We then come to the fourth way point, which is, you know, the end, the end, as it were. And that is that realizing that it is currency going down rather than prices rising, the public reject the currency entirely and it becomes valueless. It rapidly becomes valueless. Once the process starts, there is no hope for the currency. So that basically is where these policy decisions are likely to take us. And this is a very important point, which I think people have got to begin to understand, because if you've got no protection by having something outside the fiat currency system, then you are going to be totally exposed to these problems. Back to our proposal by Omarova, the proposed comptroller of the currency, it seems that the next response uh, is most likely to be this centralized cu currency completely under control of the powers that be, and most likely capital controls on that. So you can't just you participate as, as much as you'd like to in a crack up boom, so to speak, by saying, I'm just going to pull everything out of, out of my account and go buy real things. If you're told, well, you can only pull out enough to cover your rent or meager uh, food budget each month and, and let, the rest has to stay on deposit. Um, in, in that kind of a scenario, uh, how do people, how does it affect ordinary individuals? How does it affect the, the timeline of the destruction of a replacement currency if that replacement currency is also this fiat digital based on nothing, but, it's, but your access to be able to withdraw it and spend it is, is more uh, contrived and, con and constricted than it ever has been in history? Yeah, well, hold on a minute, because <laughs> while the, the 
comptroller of the currency she hopes elect uh, might want to, uh, uh, if you like, go along with the central bank digital currency playbook, the fact of the matter is that all the deposits at the moment are with the commercial banks, and those can be liquidated. So it's not a question of the Fed suddenly um, adopting all the um, outstanding deposits in the in the banking system, deposits and loans in the commercial banking system. That's not what's being proposed. What's being proposed is that uh, there will be a new currency, effectively issued by the Fed by the Fed under the Fed's control. That's the whole point about the new digital currency. So um, again, I think if we look at the history of this, if uh, we have a, a situation where um, the existing currency is being abandoned by um, the state, by the system, uh, and therefore becomes a rapidly valueless. Because this is this this would be bad for for uh, conventional dollars. Let's let's be clear about that. Then, under those circumstances, um, you're looking at um, a parallel with what happened at the time of the French Revolution, the destruction of the assignat, which was. Um, uh, a currency which was issued, it was uh, notionally secured on church property. Um, and uh, this happened um, just before the revolution. It continued through the revolution. And of course, once they had one issue, they couldn't resist having another issue and another and another. And the result was that the purchasing power of the Assignat um, disappeared. It became hated. Then they introduced another currency to replace it. And of course, everybody said, "Hooray! We got rid of the old one." You know, this will, this will, this is bound to be better. But within six months, that went too. The fact of the matter is that if you introduce a new currency, unbacked by anything, then people are going to learn from the destruction of the first currency that this one has no credibility either. I don't think it'll last five minutes. And I think the other problem is that knowing central banks, knowing government departments, knowing the bureaucracy, they would probably expect to have um, a testing and a bedding in um, process, which would last the thick end of five years to a decade. I mean, you know, but we don't have that amount of time. Things are happening a lot more quickly now than um, we might have even expected, say, a year ago. And that's the point about these waypoints. You can see that, um, you know, quite quickly, bond yields will start rising. If you look at the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond yield, it is already breaking up with a golden cross underneath it and uh, the level above the golden cross of the moving averages. I mean, this is, you know, the technicians are saying, um, you know, this is, this is a no-no. This is bad news. But of course, Nobody's really noticing it. I mean, nobody outside the system is noticing it. But this, we're getting an early warning that this is happening, that interest rates, the cost of borrowing is starting to rise. And it's not going to just stop at one or two percent. I mean, you've had uh, John Williams on your show in the past, I know, because um, uh, you've been kind enough to mention it to me. Um, and uh, shadow stats, I think the last I heard, uh, they were looking at inflation running at close to 15 percent. Um, that is, uh, you know, taking um, the official statistics and removing the adjustments, which quite clearly are in there to suppress the apparent rate of price inflation. So this is um, uh, a situation which is very, very live, and we just don't have an awful lot of time to escape it. I guess I'd like to push back and challenge a couple of the things you said, which were quite reasonable, but the problem is we were living in very demonstrably unreasonable times. When you talked about uh, how a, a fiat currency on the heels of another failed fiat currency would only last you know, a, a short time because no one would have confidence in it. If you look at the uh, the unreasonable, well, first of all, the word fiat itself is basically because I said so, and I have the power to enforce it. So if you look at the level of mandates, restrictions, and, and so on, uh, whether, uh, you know, Im, uh, imprudent, uh, unreasonable, uh, destructive that have been basically forced down the world's throat over the past uh, year and a half time period in rapid fire. Uh, that's one thing is to say, who's to say that there won't be, we won't be forced to only transact, you know, but through laws, through all kinds of things, saying you can't transact in these other other methods. Secondly, the uh, these mandates um, have been 
you said it would normally take you know years of testing time. Okay, <laughs> some other things that happened recently should have taken perhaps in the past years of testing time, and that was all just bypassed as well. So is it not uh, realistic based on recent events to conclude that it's quite possible for governments, uh, both nationally and globally, to take actions that are surprisingly draconian or surprisingly you know, force-based rather than letting it be market-driven? And secondly, that the, that the um, testing might be bypassed or short-circuited. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's not impossible that uh, governments will act very quickly. I mean, when you get a, for example, when you get a war situation, um, you know, they, they act quickly. <laughs> but um, I, what we're looking at, I think, is a situation which um, is effectively a bureaucratic decision at the end of the day to introduce uh, a new currency. And um, you can't just do this without uh, extensive consultation. Um, it, you know, it's it's it it is inconceivable, and I can't see, I can't see the commercial banks just sort of going along with this without protesting, without um, uh, leaning on the powers that be. And remember that these your your commercial banks are extremely powerful. I mean, they finance the system, and uh, I think you know the, the treasury can't just walk over them. The Fed can't just walk over them. The Fed can, okay, set monetary policy and, you know, raise interest rates a little bit, lower them a bit, whatever. Um, as long as it, what it does uh, um, is it achieves two things. First of all, it gives the impression of financial stability. And secondly, it allows the commercial banking system to continue to make money. You know, that's, that, at the end of the day, is what really matters. And if the Fed turns around with a project to remove um, depositors from banks, in effect. I just can't see the banks going along with this. So, you know, until it happens, I'm inclined to believe that it's not going to happen. I think that's probably the best assumption uh, to make. If, on the other hand, it does assumption, uh, it does actually work, then I would still maintain that um, even though uh, the powers that be try and force us in one direction or another, they don't have ultimate control over us. They think they have. I mean, this is the whole point about this Davos thing, you know, with large corporations uh, believing that they can go in there and control things. I mean, it's Marxism, if you like, under a different brand name. And um, we saw what happened to Marxism. And I really don't see that there's any different outcome from, um, uh, you know, from, from uh, if you like, central bank digital currencies. And if you like, this sort of Davos approach of trying to control what people do rather than provide services for people to do what they want. I mean, this is the difference between market freedom and statism, if you like, uh, writ large. And that basically is what Marxism is. I mean, do we really want Marxism? I can't see. I can see support going, um, you know, incrementally in that direction because um, people can be bribed that way. They say, well, you know, uh, we'll, we'll give you a bit more money. We'll give, you know, we'll give you a bit more unemployment. We'll raise the minimum wage or, you know, all these sort of things. We'll give you a bit more free health. I mean, yeah, all these are wonderful things which make you want to vote for your politician. But at the end of the day, there does come a point where you say, now, come on, this is, and generally that point is on your own personal, spend own personal spending. I mean, you don't want government to turn around and tell you where to spend your money. You know, they already tax you. They already take purchasing power away from you, if you really understood it, by diluting um, the purchasing power of fiat currency. But to actually tell you where to spend your money, now that I really do think is a bridge too far. I will claim that's already been happening. I mean, shoot, in in Australia, you are even told whether you can leave your house or not. And and secondly, uh, we've the other thing that has been employed quite effectively, it seems, on a global basis, is this basically uh, weaponizing people's empathy towards uh, over, against themselves, against their country, against their sovereignty, against their own currency, etc., uh, their freedom to choose, because. Uh, for example, being able to choose whether you, how you, mode of travel that you want to take and you're being told no, you have to do the thing that, that's the most carbon friendly or that sort of thing. So when you said, I can't believe people will want to live with Marxism, two parts of that is one is we're being fed, fed Marxism under other names and under wrappings and other, other descriptions, whether we like it or not. But secondly, many of the younger generation in particular or those who follow mass media are being 
conditioned to believe that this is virtuous or this is good for them, it's good for their fellow man, they've got to take care of each other, that sort of thing. So is that not what we are actually experiencing right now is in fact a rapid, perhaps more rapid than ever before, a global transition to the reality of Marxism under the name of other things? Yes, I would accept, I would accept your, your, your point. Um, but um, I would make the point that um, in extremists, you know, we, it will get to a point where basically we decide whether we're human beings um, with control over our own lives or whether we are autom automatons, if you like, controlled by the artificial intelligence of um, government departments. I, you know, there will come a point where the whole thing splits. Uh, of that I have no doubt, um, because the whole basis of uh, economics is the division of labor. And the division of labor, well, you know, we obviously have to pay attention to what, um, you know, the laws and so on the governments um, uh, pass to restrict what we can do and what we can't do, restrict what we're allowed to buy and what we're not, not allowed to buy and so on. Uh, I would take all that as, as, you know, that is the current situation. But ultimately, if I want to um, satisfy my needs in a certain direction, and the government really gets in the way, then I and all those like me, which is everybody, um, will rebel against it. It is human nature. You cannot, you cannot suppress human nature. You can do it maybe for a very short period of time, as the Australians are over this COVID thing. But even then, the big, big kick, kicking back on it. Um, I can't see, and I think also that um, when you look at what's going on in the European Union, um, the divisions there are just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think that's likely to fall apart. And I think it will fall apart because on the one side you have got savers, such as Germans, um, uh, the, the Dutch, Finns and so on. And you've got profligate borrowers, the Mediterranean countries, and I would include France in that. And, um, you know, you can't have a situation where you've got one currency where one lot are all, you know, all providing the money for everybody else and finding that the money that they're providing, their savings are being debauched by the central bank at the same time. At the end of the day, something it will give. And I think that um, in that case, it won't be terribly long. I mean, we've, we've got um, potential crises coming in from different directions. I mean, we concentrated on talking about the dollar also, there is the euro. That is a huge problem. And I mean, Britain is following um, sort of rather lamely the Anglo-Saxon American <laughs> monetary approach. And I look at our government. I mean, this is a case in point. Um, they were elected. I mean, before they were, before they formed a government, um, our current um, politicians were almost libertarians to a man. Now they're the biggest of big state spenders. I mean, we had a budget, um, uh, a mini budget, which was uh, earlier uh, last week. And, um, you know, you look at that and you think, you know, these guys are a statist. I mean, they are worse than the socialists. So, you know, where does that leave us? I mean, the whole system is trying to destroy personal freedom. Now, I won't accept the idea that ultimately that personal freedom will be destroyed. We will kick back and it won't happen. It will be very painful. Um, and I can see currencies being destroyed in the process. I mean, that's the bulk of what we've been talking about. And that's why, um, uh, you know, we differentiate between money and currency. I mean, money is the real stuff. Currency is what governments produce. People need to understand what that distinction is. And they ought to, ought to uh, understand that to have everything tied to currency is proving to be riskier and riskier as every day passes. passes. Now, if government had total control over us and they progressed artificial intelligence to the point where, um, you know, we would respond, either respond automatically or our responses could be predicted and governments could therefore um, uh, head them off at the pass, whatever, whatever. It may be different, but I don't believe that's the case. That leads us to our final question. Christoph S. says, what gives Alistair hope for the future? Um, and that is a good question, actually. I would put it this way. Um, I'm getting bored um, with my life being wasted 
by governments trying to keep a clearly bankrupt system, a system which stops ordinary people like us progressing our lives. I'm getting fed up with it. I want to get this out of the way so that, I mean, I'm what, 73, I've got a life expectancy to 81. I mean, that's the, the statistical average. You know, I don't want to spend the last days of my life with um, governments clamping down on me. I mean, I feel very sorry for the people who are in Russia, say, um, in the 1960s. I mean, they had another, what, 20 odd years of this, um, of this, you know, oppressive behavior getting worse and worse and worse. So in a sense, my hope is that because it is going to happen, it happens quickly, we get it over and done with. I will have taken measures to protect myself and my family. I hope that everybody viewing this will consider doing the same. And let's just get the whole thing over and then get on with our lives. Because the one thing that we have and we we, we, we must value most is time. The rest of it, if you like, is supplementary, supplementary to that. Alistair, we always, always appreciate your visits here with us. And if people want to follow your weekly and even uh, twice weekly writings, where can they get plugged in? Uh, goldmoney.com um, and uh, hit the research tab. And I write an article every Thursday. It's published in the sort of, I suppose, late morning, early afternoon EST. Um, and I do a market report on the Friday. And while you're there, have a look at um, the um, facilities that gold money might offer you to um, store gold and silver um, in a different jurisdiction from perhaps America, just to make it that little bit more difficult for your benign government, for your new office of the controller of the current. Yeah, your, Om your Omarova risk reduction policy. Yeah. And folks, we've been told as recently as last night during a live chat that people who have subscribed to receive notifications when we post new interviews, such as with Alistair and all of our guests on YouTube, are not receiving those notifications. They said, you're being shadow banned, done again. So I'm letting you know, if you haven't done this already, it's so straightforward. You just go to libertyandfinance.com, put your name, your email address, click submit, and you'll get a confirmation email. Once you confirm you're in our daily emails, we'll send you out with, you'll never miss a single link to any of our interviews with Alistair or any of the articles that he shares with us or any of our guests and the articles that they share, make sure you go to libertyandfinance.com, put in your name, email address, get on our free, all free email list. Alistair, on behalf of all of our viewers, thank you as always for joining us here on Liberty and Finance. That's very much my pleasure, DK. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs.